interested in the structure function relationship spe uh, specific of membrane proteins and I have been really doing cryo-EM for quite uh, some time, so at the time where people actually advised me uh, what the heck am I actually doing with cryo-EM and luckily then things turn out differently as, as you all know. Specifically, I'm interested in uh, membrane transporters and if we talk about membrane transporters, we like to differentiate between three different types of classes or the channels and then also active transporters which we then further differentiate according to the source of energy. So for example, if they um, uh, hydrolyze ATP, then we talk about primary active transporters and if we have just a counter ion, then we have secondary active transporters. As a structural biologist, of course, everything that we obtain are structural snapshots, so we have to be aware of that, although with Quarium we can also get some more insights into the conformational landscapes and thereby hints to the dynamics, but nevertheless, to really understand the mechanism of action and regulation on the molecular level of these nanomachines, we really need to not only exploit all the advantages you have with structural biology, but combine it then with um, proper um, uh, functional assays and, of course, also some MD simulations, as I will show you, which we then do in collaboration. So I'm interested really, and we have several projects on all different classes of, of these membrane transporters, but over um, uh, the last years I gained particular interest in what I like to call the odd ones. So these are transporters that actually challenge the conceptual boundaries of us really trying to very strictly separate them into these different classes. And uh, KDPMDC complex is the one that I'm going to talk to about today, is really a chimera between a, a channel and a primary active P-type ATPase. Just two words of more technical aspect if people are uh, more interested in this. All the structures I'm going to show you were actually taken in our in-house uh, Talus Artica, so 200 kilovolt machine. If you know what you're doing and really have the patience for it, you can get extremely um, beautiful data out of it. Um, but nevertheless, of course, I want to um, uh, um, still, we are all absolutely dependent on the high-end res um, um, resolution electron microscopes. And here, just a political statement. In the Netherlands, we really, really need to find uh, the means to replace per case and actually get uh, more type of prices for our national facility at Nason, and this is also, of course, very important for the instruct. Back to biology. So, KDPFEBC, before time runs out, I'd like to um, highlight all the collaborators um, which have been actually a uh, um, uh, very fruitful uh, team we set up. So, from the beginning, um, we teamed up with Inga Hennel from the University of Frankfurt when we realized that we both were interested in this protein. So, from the beginning, we have finally been collaborating on this. And more recently, for MD simulations, we also teamed up with Phil Stansfield. So, KDP at ABC, I already told you it's a chimera, so it's, it only um, uh, uh, is found in prokaryotes. Actually, as a full disclosure, it's a very, very rare evolutionary rare event, so only a few bacteria and archaea have it. So this is, to some extent, a more curiosity-driven project in my lab, but as you will see by the end, we, the more we understand this protein, the more we realize it actually might be an early ancestor of the typical P-type ATPases that we have nowadays, so it makes it again also more interesting. Um, since it is a potassium uptake system, it belongs to the superfamily of potassium transporters, and from a functional point of view, it is really an emergency potassium uptake system, why it has a high affinity, high specificity, and can cope with a very steep gradient. So when all the other potassium uptake systems fail to, to pump potassium in, is when KDBABC becomes uh, um, expressed and uh, activated. But as I already told you a couple of times, what is really unique about this is that we have a true chimera coming together, um, formed by this PTAP ATPase unit and this channel life unit. So let me just give you a few more introductions that you can follow my talk a little bit better. So the color code will also always remain this way. So KDPB unit is really a, a classical PTAP ATPase. It has, compared to others, a little bit of a minimal composition. And this is, of course, an energizing unit which can hydrolyze ATP and, and provides the driving force to really pump the potassium against the electrochemical gradient. For those that are a little bit more familiar with P-type ATPases, they are always described according to the post albert cycle where we have this E1 and E2 states which basically just define the different states of ATP hydrolysis, dephosphorylation and to, um, to which side of the membrane the canonical binding site is uh, accessible to. Um, so just another thing that I would like to point out for the rest of the talk is then of course you also have this um, soluble domains which are very particular for P-type ATPases, um, so the N domain which binds the ATP, the P domain where the um, where, uh, catalytic aspartate is phosphorylated, 
and the ADMA, which is basically later on responsible for the default relation of this catalytic um, acetate. Um, and the cyclo domains undergo very, very large conformational changes, and by this you can define at which state um, in the cycle you, you are in this compatibility case. So they basically then induce also the conformational changes required in the transmembrane domain. So the other subunit KDPA is really a KCSA-like potassium catalyst. It's very homologous to it, it has a selectivity filter, it has sort of a pore, although we have a coupling helix around there. And for a very, very long time, for decades actually, it was assumed that we have a spatial separation. Oh, um, well, just uh, for full disclosure, of course you still have a C and F, which we think are more of um, chaperones, and overall the, the protein is still, well, fairly um, small, I mean, now it's, it's relatively small and asymmetric, of course. And what is intriguing is, um, considering um, this, this whole setup, it is intriguing to understand exactly how potassium are transported, how is ATP strictly coupled to the potassium transport, um, and whatever the answer is, it's already clear this, this is most certainly um, a so far new mechanism of action. So, and for a very, very long time, for decades, it was assumed that you have what we call a, um, a spatial separation, where it was assumed that the P-type ATPA subunit is really the only one responsible for um, the ATP hydrolysis, so for energizing it, but it's not directly involved in the potassium transport, and the potassium transport is solely done by the um, uh, channel-like subunit. And this was uh, further propagated by the first structure um, from, from a, a another group in 2017. Um, this is the first structure of KDP and ABC in an E1 state, an outward open state. And just to, to highlight it more schematically, um, please just follow this, this, this scheme. And basically what was the, the most characteristic feature of this structure is that um, we could identify, or they could identify an intersubunit tunnel that which connects these two subunits with each other. However, as they propagated the spatial separation um, model, they proposed that uh, potassium binding and going through the selectivity filter would basically change electrostatic environment, which would be sent by the protein wire, and that would then induce a conformational change of the canonical binding site and the cytoplasmic uh, um, uh, domains, which would then pull on this uh, certain coupling helix and then release potassium to the outside. Without going too much in, in, in detail, there were a lot of um, uh, issues with this model why we never um, entirely believed that this can be true. And well, again, to cut the long story short, um, already in 2017, 2018, um, we had already obtained um, uh, our first RM structures of this protein at different states of the, the transport cycle. And this already allowed us to propose a so far new and unprecedented um, um, transport mechanism which uh, um, I, I believe by now it's really entirely accepted also by this other group as the, the, the way of most certain works. So what we have here is that we really believe that um, the potassiums um, go through a selectivity filter but then propagate through this intersubunit tunnel down to the P-type ATPAs and from here on it would almost be the classical boring P-type ATPA cycle that, that um, takes place. So that we really have KDPB directly involved in ion transport. Um, also here to cut a long story short, we could, I think, convincingly now also really, um, well, it's not a proof, but a very, very strong indication that we really have potassium going through. I mean, MD simulations show that it can propagate. It's not something entirely unstable. And also by using quarium and uh, using different um, ions, so we, we could also obtain a structure instead of potassium with rubidium. And we see indeed the stronger scatter again, given an indication when we see stronger scatter really along the, the intersection of the tunnel. Again, Again, being a confirmation that uh, the ion, the cation, can pass through the in this intersubunit tunnel. So, what are the open questions that I actually want to highlight today? It's really how are potassium uh, ions further propagated? Um, how is the coupling, the strict coupling between the transport and the hydrolysis taking place? And later on, also a little bit on a more regulatory side, which is still unpublished. As I told you, we do a, um, a lot of uh, combinations of functional characterization and desimulation of quarium. I mean, it always is not the best choice to give a talk right after Shores Shears, despite the lunch break. Although I confirm that nowadays, I mean, I'm doing EM also since a while now, um, solving one structure during a PhD as one can be a big deal, but nowadays it's also not unusual to get several structures, so I thought I can be proud today and say, oh, we have 16 structures already for this protein. Well, I can't beat uh, Shores, but I agree that, um, of course, Clarium allows you now, um, um, it is easier to get uh, uh, or aim for several structures 
to aim um, um, off the protein of interest, we have to really get more details in, into, um, into its mechanism. So we have by now obtained six instructions with it, and, and um, we use um, different ones to, to guide you through what I'm going to show you today. So um, to talk about the potassium ion propagation, how we believe that the coupling is cyclically uh, um, maintained, uh, we mainly used uh, uh, this data set, which went down to 3.1 extra resolution, and this is, w which is of course much better actually in the intercept in the tunnel, so there it goes uh, below, so it's at 2.9 roughly, and this has been the model that we also use for the MD simulations. And if we do the MD relaxation, there's already one thing that we notice. So in gray are the ones that from the aquarium, and in uh, purple the ones that basically after the relaxation, uh, the positions that the potassium ions can uh, occupy. And already looking at the energetics of this, you see that of course that around the selectivity filter, it's, it's very energetically favorable. But what was interesting is that we have around this aspartate 583, which is located here, and we call it then the proximal binding site. We also have a very favorable um, energy well here. But then we also perform uh, atomistic MD simulations to get an idea into how the, the um, uh, how these ions can propagate. And again, this is, I'm really cutting a very, very long story short, perhaps it's a thesis, it's all written up in, in this publication over here. And this is just uh, one of the, the models that we run through for the wild type, so we can then also to some extent quantify the, the occupancy of the potassium ions um, along the intercept with the tunnel. And then we really differentiate between this um, distal binding site, the proximal binding site, and the canonical binding site, which is the one important, uh, the final one, for the PTAP ATPases. And, um, um, and well, it's very clear that here we have an energy well which uh, serves as a soaking. And what is even more interesting is that this phenylalanine really seems to have a threefold function. And I will try to summarize it and guide you through what we uh, believe we can extract out of all the data. And this, of course, also accompanied by a lot of functional data, which I'm really just summarizing now for the sake of time in this scene. So we, feel, so we are going to run through this e, E1, E2 uh, cycle, and what we believe happens is that in an E1 open, so we have it, um, uh, um, so potassium can enter the selectivity filter via our channel-like subunit, and so these here are, are exactly sitting at the interface between these, these two, so you have a, a right orientation. What we believe that happens is that this aspartate basically creates uh, this energy well which serves as a soaking, so any potassium that has already entered the subunit tunnel can then pass this restriction side of the phenylalanine and get soaked into this PDS. So that's already the function of this position here, so we, uh, we have the soaking effect. And what we also believe from the functional and combining this with the functional data is that the moment we have a potassium bound here, this would probably of all certainly stimulate ATP hydrolysis. So what happens further, so if the beta was an ATP bound and it, it becomes hydrolyzed, what happens is that the potassium that passed um, over here, I mean, of course, and there are other potassiums in the intersubunit funnel that might come, come forward, and then you have here by this pi interaction, um, a, a new potassium ion coming in might cut, pick off uh, the one that is on the PBS and, and allow the ions to progress further. So in here, I would already like to highlight two of the functions that we believe the new element has. So first of all, it serves as a gatekeeper because it's really hysterically hindering um, um, and thereby probably prevents that unspecific binding might occupy this position here and that would already prevent uh, um, large extent the uncoupling of ATP without potassium actually being bound um, where it should be. Then, oh, there's already some drops coming. Um, okay, I'll hurry up. <laughs> Um, and as you see here, of course, it is also directly involved in the propagation of the ions via this uh, pi stacking um, system that we have over there. If you progress further in the cycle, um, it is being cyclized across the, um, the, the P domain has been phosphorylated, and what we think happens here, this could also happen stochastically that we have this uh, uh, protonation switch between this niacin and this aspartate. In the moment this happens, of course, the potassium ion can go, um, uh, can pass further now to the canonical binding site. What is also important, of course, now with this protonated aspartate or slightly protonated aspartate, we lose the energy well. So first of all, this avoids that this might be soaked back. And also that we don't have another driving force directly of something coming in, which you also don't want um, to maintain the stoichiometry. And if we go further in, in time, I mean, this is something we know from other structural data that we have, 
is that it is lies in the moment we have the, the, the big transition from the E1 to the E2P uh, state, which means that we shift from an outward open to an inward open state of the, P to, of the transmembrane domain. We know that this um, um, lysine can act as a counter ion and basically really pushes the potassium out, which can also now go outside because we have now this new tunnel facing the intracellular uh, open up, which was uh, prevented in the E1 states. So this is what happens here, and also this is something you, you rather have to believe me because from functional data, we know that if we start mutating this renewalin and also that these studies supports this, we see that we um, end up having also an increase in ATP hydrolysis and so on, so that we also believe that the phenylalanine might um, at least partially be modulating this rate-limiting E1P to E2P transition, and structurally it also makes sense because um, this phenylalanine is directly linked to the Hades that um, is uh, directly connected to the A domain, which is very important in uh, this transition. So that just as a little bit of a summary of how, um, by combining functional cryogenic data and uh, MD simulations, how we um, believe to have a more detailed notion of the ion progression and um, uh, how the strictly ATP coupling. But now let me um, talk a little bit more, and this is uh, unpublished um, data, is how we believe the, the regulation of KDP at ABC takes place. So again, a little bit of an introduction. Um, this is something that, that is known and was um, uh, very nicely uh, also biochemically studied in this Sweet et al. paper from, from another group. So we know that KDPABC is inhibited at high potassium concentration. This makes actually a lot of sense because this is a very, very efficient potassium pump. So you, of course, need it under emergency conditions, but the moment that potassium concentration becomes rather okay intracellularly, you want this machine to directly stop. So that makes a lot of sense, and biochemically, um, uh, we know by now that uh, um, the inhibition takes place by a phosphorylation of the KDP series 162. And also here, from a structural point of view, important for you to know is this series is exactly the series from this TGES motive. What is this? This is the prominent loop sitting in the A domain, which is responsible for the dephosphorylation of the uh, catalytic aspartate. So it's very, very important in the, in the whole uh, transport cycle. So we know that the inhibition occurs when this site is phosphorylated. We further know from biochemical studies that somehow um, it becomes, the whole complex becomes stalled in a somehow E1P state. And this is something that is rather unique among P-type ATPases, at least this here in phosphorylation of the TGS motive. So for, to understand this, this further, this is where we have really to go uh, deeper and obtain um, study very, like, complete different uh, settings of how we try to obtain some structural data. And again, I will try to guide you through that in a more schematic way. So this is a transport mechanism that I've already shown you. So the first thing that we did was to get a feeling for, okay, how would this, what would we get structurally, what are the, the, the classes that we would normally, confirmation that we would normally trap um, structurally when we have a fully functional protein. So for this purpose, we use a non-inhibited KDKBC complex. How do we do we that? Well, simply mutating the serine to, to an alanine. And what we did then is to, to see which conformational um, states we obtain under turnover conditions. So this is now the beauty of cryo-EM. You can really be bold and intentionally um, uh, prepare cryo-EM samples where you already aim to um, have a very heterogeneous uh, um, data set. This is exactly what you want to, to, to get insights into what are the rather stable states if I allow the protein to actually constantly be um, going through the entire uh, transport cycle. So if we use this um, uh, the setting, what is interesting is that we were mostly able to um, uh, um, populate two main uh, uh, states, and this is the E1P, AP, and the two uh, E2P state. And what is important here as a take-home message, this was fantastic, is, is because it really shows that a non-inhibited KPDC can transition through the entire cycle. Why do I say this? Because we really are sampling two opposite sides of the transport cycle. So this is really a confirmation of, of, um, of that. Okay. So what happens if we use wild-type KDKBC, which we express at very high potassium concentration so that we know that it will um, be to over 90% inhibited, so where the serine 162 will be phosphorylated, 
And so how does it, the picture change if we now have it also under turnover conditions? And what we obtain were these three states over here. Um, so uh, E1 ATP bound already, an E1 piece of phosphorylated state with ADP still bound, and this weird um, uh, um, uh, non, well, um, un well, non known um, uh, conformation state for any P type ATPs, which showed a fairly compact uh, conformation. So, this is just an overview from here to there. If we turn it around, you see that the A domain um, basically um, has very, very strong contacts with, with the, the, the N domain. And this is something a conformational state which um, has not been seen in any other P type ATPs. And because it has such a compact fold, we call it an E1 P type state. And we, but if we look at the Densities is fair enough for that. We know for sure that the aspartate is also still phosphorylated. So it's E1P type state, which somehow must be in between uh, these two. Um, but the biggest take home message from, from this exercise is that, in contrast to when we did not have the serine phosphorylated, so the non inhibited state, we could sample also E2 states. But if the protein is inhibited, we somehow cannot transition into this half of the transport cycle. And that is also what was predicted biochemically, that somehow we get stuck in an E1P state. So that overall, and again, I'm just, um, oh, and, and we even tested this further by also trying to obtain, under, under the same conditions with orthovalidate, which is actually known to track E2 states of P-type ATPases, but even then, under similar conditions, we only end up with an E1P type state, which we accumulate. So what is the take home message here? Well, the inhibited KDP we see cannot transition to E2 state. So this is, um, again, confirming also the biochemical uh, uh, data. We have a formation of an off-cycle state, which we term the E1P type state. And this message here, I, I did not show it, but we also performed the PR studies, and we have other structures that confirm all of this. And there's a lot of data that comes into here, where we strongly believe that this type interaction between the A and the N domain is not the, at least not the determinant cause of the inhibition itself. So it's not the end state of this uh, structure that we obtain that is the reason for the inhibition. So then the question is, of course, what is it? So and this is where we get a little bit into trouble with structural biology because now we, we actually need to start guessing of what is happening or what cannot happen if I want to move from there to there. And you're, of course, limited by the structural snapshots that you can obtain. So but let me walk you through of what we think um, uh, is the case. So and, and now I just want to focus really on this transition from here to there. So in the E1P ADP state, so this is uh, the so-called high energy state in P-type ATPases, because this is the one that wants to very, very much relax into the E2P state. So this is the driving force for this big transition, which then uh, translates to the big conformational change that you have in the transmembrane. And the beam is a little bit crappy, but um, just to highlight, if you look at the high energy state, and you have the so ADP is bound, and here you have the phosphorylated um, catalytic side, the, the aspartate 307, and if you look at it, it is close to two other aspartates, extremely close, by the way. And this is, of course, a very, very unfavorable state, electrostatic repulsion, it's a high energy state, it just wants to get out of this state. And it does this normally by relaxing into the E2P state. So what happens in an E2P state? So now I have to, you have to use a little bit of your imagination because I told you we are, we are of course stuck with the structural snapshots that we get. So this is in the, now we are looking just a slice through um, from, from the top basically to see this better. Um, in a big transition from an E1P to an E2P state, you have very, very large conformation changes. And at this level, you want um, the next step is that this um, D307 becomes dephosphorylated. For this, the TG, as noted, needs to move uh, close to it. So you really have this large rearrangement where this loop comes close to there. So this is what you then end up with an E2P state. But the thing is, if the serine 162 is, is also phosphorylated, you end up with a very, very strong electrical repulsion as well. Um, so this is why we believe that if um, KDBC has this inhibitory phosphorylation, it's, although it wants to, it simply cannot transition into an E2P state. So this is a little bit of an extrapolation that we do, but all the data confirms that. So what else can, can then the protein do? Well, it can go into this E1P type state. Why? Why is this favorable? 
If you compare now this E1 p type, say, to all other, say, E1 states that we have, we see that all E1 states actually show almost identical uh, uh, conformational state, at least here over um, in this region. But the E1p type state shows already some rotations. And these rotations are reminiscent of, to some extent, but not fully, of the rotations that these domains undergo when they do a to E2p state. So this is for us already an indication that it was really tried, couldn't, and then gets trapped in a, in a relaxed state. Why do we believe this is to be the relaxed state? Well, if you look again at this high energy um, uh, location where we have the strong repulsion of this phosphorylation site with two aspartates, we see now that the movement of this, this end domain, I told you that it, it really moves, moves away and forms a contact with the A domain, and by doing this, it actually pulls on this loop where our phosphorylated aspartate is sitting, it uncoils this loop, and the effect of this is that we have our phosphorylated, like the, the phosphorylated aspartate is now completely pointed in a different direction, in the, at almost 180 degrees. And by this, it moved out of this clash that we have here, so this clearly represents a relaxed state. And this is what we believe that, that happens, that it simply um, tries to relax, tries to, to transition to an E1P state, it cannot, and then it can basically relax it to this E1P type state, and it resides in there, although it's not entirely irreversible. And this explains also why the end state itself is not the, the, full, like the, the, the full reason for the, for the inhibition, but rather the, the attempt of transitioning it to there. Yeah, and this is basically, um, the extended mechanism that we have now with this regulatory off cycle where we really believe that the E1P type state is rather a consequence of the impaired uh, E1P, E2P transition. And this brings me already to my uh, uh, conclusion side. So I hope I could, uh, um, as a, at least a little bit of a teaser that Katie can you see, although it only happens rarely in nature, it's actually a pretty cool uh, system. It shows how a P type HPAs can hijack a testing channel probably for the sake of its substrate uh, spe uh, selectivity or specificity. Um, I hope I could show you that we really have a new chimeric mechanism with this intersubunit channel where the potassiums uh, go through. And it also a, a beautiful example that shows how conserved protein architecture can actually merge together to adapt in other um, environmental needs. Um, I hope I can also show you, um, at least to some extent, the details of, uh, that we have into ion propagation, where we think that this triad of uh, um, residues plays a, a, a very important role, and we, um, at least to a large extent, can explain the type coupling of uh, ATP hydrolysis and transport. And what is interesting is that this triad is not, uh, con it's conserved among KDPB, of course, but not among all p type ATPases. But single elements of this are conserved throughout p-type ATPases, which again give a hint that KDPFABC might be an early uh, descendant or common ancestor. Then, um, related to the serum phosphorylation, um, I think that our data confirms um, uh, or supports and strengthens a lot of the biochemical data that was already there, and we could now basically for the first time also structurally uh, properly characterize this uh, inhibited state, which then goes into this E1P type conformation. And this is also in P-type ATPases, these off cycles is, has been something that has been discussed so for quite some time. And this is really um, uh, perhaps one of the first uh, examples where we really also um, dive a little bit more into the structural um, like the details of it. And with this, I end up with my safety slide. The most important people already showed at the beginning, so that's, that's the most important. Of course, the funding, and uh, I always thank the microscope as well. Well, and for those that know, well, this is uh, last week, I think, or two weeks ago, where I, uh, early in the morning, we had a little mimosa to unofficially celebrate that I have been uh, promoted to associate professor now. <laughs> the rector still has to uh, sign it, but I think I can <laughs> already say it. Yeah, thank you.